Matthew chapter 2, and I'll begin by reading the first 12 verses. Excuse me, first 18 verses. So a little bit lengthier of a passage here, but for the sake of context, we'll read through verse 18. Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and are come to worship him. When Herod the king had heard these things, he was troubled in all Jerusalem with him. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes and the people together, he demanded of them where Christ should be born. And they said unto him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet, And thou, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, art not the least among the princes of Judah, for out of thee shall come a governor that shall rule my people Israel. Then Herod, when he had privately called the wise men, inquired of them diligently what time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search diligently for the young child, and when you have found him, bring me word again that I may come and worship him also. When they had heard the king, they departed, and lo, the star which they saw in the east went before them, and till it came and stood over where the young child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. And when they were come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary his mother, and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented unto him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. And being warned of God in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed into their own country another way. And when they were departed, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise, and take the young child and his mother, and flee into Egypt, and be thou there until I bring thee word. For Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. When he arose, he took the young child and his mother by night and departed into Egypt, and was there until the death of Herod, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Out of Egypt have I called my son. Then Herod, when he saw that he was mocked of the wise men, was exceeding wroth, and sent forth and slew all the children that were in Bethlehem, and in all the coasts thereof, from two years old and under, according to the time which he had diligently inquired of the wise men. Then was fulfilled that which was spoken by Jeremy the prophet, saying, In Ramah there was a voice heard, lamentation and weeping and great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children, and would not be comforted, because they are not. I'd like to preach you a message this morning entitled, A King is Born. When we read in Luke chapter 2 of the night that Jesus was born, how the angels appeared to the shepherds and told them that down in the town of Bethlehem they would find the Messiah. The angels did not identify Him as a king. They simply said, a Savior is born. It was not until some time later, and we don't know how much time has elapsed, uh, con uh, contrary to most nativity scenes, the wise men were not there on the night that Jesus was born. Because when the wise men came, as we read here, they found Mary and Joseph in a house along with baby Jesus. But that aside, in the time that it, it took for them to get there, uh, it's not until they arrive that anything is said about a king being born. And as, as Matthew writes this letter, this book, this gospel record... He's writing it from a Jewish standpoint to a primarily Jewish audience. So they were very familiar with this idea of a promised king, a promised ruler that was going to come as the king of Israel, and he was going to uh, rule them in perfect justice and equity. It was going to be a utopia. And that's what everybody was expecting at some point to happen. However, they weren't really expecting it to happen when it happened or how it happened when Jesus was born. And so Matthew writing here in chapter 2, he, he opens this chapter by making a statement about a fellow who named Herod. Herod the king, he is identified in verse number 1. And 
As you look back in, in uh, history of, of Israel and, and during that time of Roman occupation, you find that there was quite a lot of rulers named Herod. It was kind of a, uh, a family name that was passed down for several generations. And so you have to do a little digging to identify which one this is. And, and come to find out, this is actually the one that is known in secular history as Herod the Great. Now, he's called the Great because of the great things that he accomplished from a secular point of view. But I'm here to tell you that he was anything but a great person in a biblical sense. He was a very, very wicked man. Nevertheless, he was the ruler, the earthly ruler of this area of Israel at this particular time. He is the king for all intents and purposes over this area. So you can imagine his shock in, when these men from the east show up saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? Because they were asking this of the man who was allegedly the king of the Jews. The wise men were then the first ones in the written record of Scripture to identify baby Jesus as the king of Israel. And understand that in that is where our lesson starts this morning. That there is great wisdom in recognizing that Jesus is the King. And surrendering your life and letting Him be the King of you. As we look in this story, we're going to see a contrast between Herod the Great and Jesus the true King of Kings. And Herod really can stand in for anyone that we might give rule of our lives to, including our own selves. The wickedness that we see in him, we all have that same seed of wickedness in our own hearts, that same sin. And so it boils down to simply this. Are we going to surrender our life to King Jesus? Or are we going to rule ourselves. Notice with me some of the characteristics of Herod and, and by contrast the characteristics of Jesus. First of all, in these opening verses we find just a little bit of a hint of just how selfish and proud that Herod was. For sake of the outline I'll simply say he was unsurrendered. He was unsurrendered. In verse number 3, when Herod heard about the news and heard what these wise men asked and what they said, it, it tells us in Scripture that he was troubled in all Jerusalem with him. Now why in the world would Herod be troubled at this wonderful news that the long looked for Messiah who would rule Israel perfectly had been born? Why would that trouble him? And why would those around him there in Jerusalem also be upset by this news? It was because Herod was not a man who was in the habit of surrendering his rule to anyone. Herod ruled for about 40 years in Jerusalem. And he got to his position through a, a series of schemes and manipulations. And, and one of the things that Herod the Great became most famous for was murdering everyone that he viewed as a rival. And I'm not just talking about political opponents on the opposite end of the aisle. This was a man that had his sons killed. This was a man that had his wife killed. This was a man who, when he knew he was about to die, ordered that at his death other nobles also be executed so that somebody would mourn for something when he died. This is the kind of man that he was. Interestingly, he would do anything in order to stay in power. One of the times when he had to collect taxes to send to Rome in order to maintain his position. He even robbed the grave of King David, according to history. Can you imagine this guy having so little respect for authority that he would steal treasures out of the famous King David? One uh, 
One commentator said this, The last days of Herod were embittered by endless court intrigues and conspiracies, and by an almost insane suspicion on part of the aged king, by an increasing indications of the restlessness of the nation. This guy was just obsessed with the idea that somebody was going to come and take his throne from him. So now does it help you when we read about how these wise men showed up and said, Hey, where's the king of the Jews? This is not a guy who would will willingly and readily say, Oh, sure, I'll step aside and let another king take control. No, he would do everything in his power to stay in control. We also read here how that, and we'll touch on this more in a minute, after his visit with the wise man, he went so far as to order the death of all the children two years old and under in and around Jerusalem, just because he was so paranoid that someone else might take control. This is this Herod, okay? To say he is proud, selfish, and unsurrendered honestly seems like a little bit of an understatement, does it not? But as I said at the very beginning here, that we see in Herod glimpses of things that we all have the seed of in our own hearts. I know that we like to think, and, and I hope it is true, that we would never go to such horrific extents as Herod did, and to order the murder of innocent people in order to maintain control. But the truth is, each of us fights for the control of our life all the time. Our flesh desperately wants to be in charge. And our flesh will do whatever it can in order to maintain control of our own lives. To simply put, you and I want to be king on the throne of our heart. We want to be in charge. We want to call the shots. We want to do what we want to do. And we don't want anybody else telling us otherwise. In our natural state, we too are unsurrendered. Now I want you to think about this in contrast to Jesus. Because whereas Herod was one of the worst examples of selfishness, pride, and that insatiable desire to control one's own destiny, Jesus is the greatest example of humility, of selflessness, and of total surrender to the Father's will. We, we see it pictured even here as, as Herod, where is he at? He is in a palace in the capital city surrounded by servants and all of the diplomats and he is living in the lap of luxury. But where is Jesus? He's in a rented house somewhere in the town of Bethlehem, only staying there for a short while, having just recently been born in a manger in a stall somewhere and having to be laid in a food trough because they didn't have a proper crib for it. What a contrast that is. Whereas Herod was an arrogant one who liked to lord over others, Jesus made himself the servant of all. One of my favorite Christmas passages is actually Philippians chapter 2, though it says nothing about shepherds or angels or wise men. It talks about how Jesus became human. And that's what Christmas is all about. And verses 7 and 8 of Philippians 2 says, He made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant. He didn't, Jesus did not come to this earth to be born in a king's palace, to make himself the earthly ruler of all at this time. No, he came and he made himself a servant. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. He humbled himself. That's something that nobody ever wrote about Herod the Great. He never took upon him the form of a servant. He never humbled himself and became obedient unto death. In fact, he fought it tooth and nail to the very end because the last thing he could even stand to think about was him dying and somebody else taking the throne. He wanted to be in charge forever. 
Jesus was a servant. Jesus was submissive. He came to this earth not to do His own will, but to do the will of Him that sent Him, to do His Father's will. He said in John 4 verse 34, My meat is to do the will of Him that sent me. And even in the garden the night before He was crucified, Jesus prayed, Not my will, thine be done. He was totally surrendered to the Father's will. Though Jesus is God, though Jesus is Lord of all, in becoming a man, He put Himself in a position of submission. He was a servant. He was submissive. He was selfless. Turn over to the book of Mark, if you would, for a moment. Chapter 10. Mark chapter 10. Look at verse number 45. Jesus said, For even the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto but to minister and to give His life a ransom for many. He did not come so that everyone could serve Him. He came so that He could serve everyone. He was selfless. Everything that Jesus did, He did it for you. That's why in Philippians chapter 2 and verse number 5, it says, Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. That selfless spirit of living for others. Do you know who Herod lived for? Herod. Jesus lived for you and me. Again, in our own hearts, we have that same selfishness, though. And that's what we revert back to many, many times. Living selfishly. Living for ourselves, doing what we want. Whatever's going to make us happy. Instead of living for others like our Savior did. Herod was unsurrendered. Whereas our Savior was a selfless surrendered servant. But there's something else about Herod that I see in, in our original text there in Matthew chapter 2. And that is that he was unlearned in Scripture. He was unlearned in Scripture. These wise men show up in Matthew chapter 2 and it says that they ask, where is he that is born king of the Jews? Because we've seen his star in the east and we've come to worship him. Herod had no idea what they were talking about. He had to call together the, the scribes and the chief priests and he had to ask them, where is this Christ supposed to be born? Now they were able to come up with the answer and they went to one of those minor prophets in and, and the book of uh, Micah and found where it said in Bethlehem of Judea, for it is written by the prophet in Bethlehem in the land of Judah, are, are not the least among the princes of Judah, for out of thee shall a, come a governor that shall rule my people. But Herod had no idea. And his entire life was a testimony to his ignorance of Scripture. Now I'm not saying he did not know what the Scripture said. I'm sure he had heard a lot of Scripture. He may have even read a lot of Scripture. But one thing is absolutely certain, he did not take it to heart. And there is a big difference between knowing what the Bible says and taking it to heart. Herod was guilty of breaking, from, from history we know, every single one of the Ten Commandments. I mean, you go down the list, he had done it. He did not live according to the Scripture. He was unlearned in the Scripture. If he had taken to heart the words of God, then, 
maybe at the end of his reign we could have called him a great ruler and a great king in an earthly sense, but certainly not as the way it is now. Now, I don't want to spend a whole lot of time on this particular point, but I do want you to think about the contrast between this aspect of Herod and our Savior. Because our Savior was the exact opposite, in that He was very learned in Scripture. He should be, because He wrote it. He is the living Word, who gave us the written Word. But here's the interesting thing. That part of Jesus' earthly existence was education. He had to learn. He increased in wisdom and in knowledge and in favor with God and man, Luke chapter 2 tells us. I don't quite understand that. I never will this side of heaven. But Jesus had to learn. He had to learn 2 plus 2. He had to learn how to read. He had to learn how to do all kinds of things. And He had to learn Scripture too. But we see in His example in the, in the New Testament the importance that Scripture should have in our lives. Jesus quoted the Old Testament Scripture almost 80 times as recorded for us in the New Testament. I'm sure He quoted it many more than that. But I'm talking about the actual record of Scripture. All, 78 times it was that Jesus quoted the Old Testament Scriptures. Why? Because He knew it was important. There are many examples of it, but let me give you just one. In Matthew chapter 4, we have the record of Jesus' temptation in the wilderness. In verses 1 through 10, you can read about it. He went there and he fasted for 40 days. And after 40 days, he was hungry and Satan came to him to tempt him. Three different times, Satan tempted Jesus in a different way. Trying to appeal to the lust of the flesh, to the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, only to find that there was none of that in Jesus, that that temptation could take root. But each time that Jesus was tempted, He responded by quoting Scripture. As it is written, He said. And three times after that phrase, He would quote a different verse from Scripture. Now I tell you, did He pull out His iPhone and say, Now wait just a second, Satan. Let me Google this real quick. Let me pull up my Bible app and search a verse that's going to help me here. No, He didn't have an iPhone. Well, did He pull out His Strong's Concordance? And No, He didn't have that either. Well, he had, a, he had a scroll strapped to his back, right? And he pulled that out and there... No, he didn't have that. So how did Jesus have that scripture to combat the temptation of Satan? He had hid it in his heart. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Jesus showed us the importance of scripture. And we cannot emphasize enough how important the Word of God is to our spiritual health. Because in Scripture, we learn about our Savior. Jesus said in John chapter 5 and verse number 39, Search the Scriptures, for in them ye think ye have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. If you want to be spiritually healthy, then you must be in the Word of God on a regular basis. Reading it, learning about it, listening to it preached, listening to it taught, taking it into your life, and not just memorizing facts in your head about what the Bible says, but taking it to heart and living it in your life. Herod had absolutely... No care whatsoever for the Scriptures. He didn't care what they said. He wasn't going to do it. He was going to live however he wanted to live. And let me tell you, you have the same tendency in your sinful flesh. Because the Word of God often is in direct contradiction of what our flesh wants to do. And there'll be a lot of times that your flesh says, you know, this, would, this sounds really good. This would be a lot of fun. I think we'd be happy if we do this. But God's Word says, no, that is a path that leads to destruction. And there's going to be a contradiction there. And you have to decide, which am I going to follow? Am I going to be like Herod and be the king of my own life and say, I'm going to do what I want to do? Or am I going to be like our Savior? And let the Word of God rule in my heart. He was unsurrendered. He was unlearned in Scripture. 
And then I, I want you to see also that he was an uncaring murderer. He was an uncaring murderer. Back in Matthew chapter 2, we won't reread all of this, but in verses 7 through 12, he, he calls the wise men back. And it says he does it privately, which is interesting. He, he calls them in for a, this private meeting, and he shares with them what the scribes and chief priests told him about Jesus being born in Bethlehem. He doesn't want anybody else to know. He's trying to keep this close. He doesn't word, want word getting out, hey, this Messiah has come because he's afraid that other people might start following that king. So he calls him in privately. He says, all right, it's supposed to, he's supposed to be down in Bethlehem, but let's keep this between us for now. Here's what I'd like for you to do. Go down to Bethlehem, find him, and when you find him, bring me word back. Bring me word back so that uh, I can come and worship him also. Now, we know that that's not what Herod wanted to do. But that's what he told the wise men. So they go and they find Mary, Joseph, and Jesus, Jesus there in the house. They give their gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And this is why we think maybe there were three, but most likely there were probably more than that. But there were three gifts, so we traditionally say three wise men. We sing the song, We Three Kings of Orient Are, right? Um, but we don't know exactly how many they are, and it's really not the point. They go and they find Jesus. They give the gifts. And then verse 12 says that God warns them in a dream not to go back to Herod, not to tell him where Jesus is, and to go home a totally different way. Basically, get out of Dodge. All right? you've, come what you've, done, you've come what you came to do. You've done that, so just get out of town. So they leave, and God warns Joseph. That Herod's going to come after Jesus' life. So take Mary and Jesus and go down to Egypt. He does. Verse 16 says that when Herod heard that the wise men did not obey him, he was exceeding wroth and he sent forth and he slew all the children that were in Bethlehem. Notice, he, he did not just... I mean, he was indiscriminate. All the children in Bethlehem and in the surrounding areas, two years old and under, all of them killed. You know, history has recorded for us a lot of brutal, murderous dictators. And when we read about some of the things that they did, our, our stomachs turn at the horrors and the atrocities. This is another in that long list of horrific things that a king did in order to stay in power. He would rather, rather murder hundreds of innocent infants than to let a threat to his rule remain. There's no differentiation here between boys and girls either. All the two years old and all of them, all the children, this had been prophesied before in the book of Jeremiah. We've looked at that in the past in the massacre of the innocents. Herod was, he was shrewd from a political standpoint. I tried to think of a modern day equivalent, but there's, there's really not. And I don't, I don't even want to attempt it. One, one, uh, one commentator said, he knew men and he knew how to use them. He lived his life lying, plotting, scheming, and murdering to get his way. And he largely succeeded. That's the kind of guy that Herod was. But let's think about this in contrast to Jesus. Because while Herod was an uncaring murderer, Jesus is the loving life giver. So much that we could say here how God preserved Jesus' life at this point because He did not come to die as an infant for our sins. There was a whole lot of life ahead of Jesus and, and God is, is doing so many things so that this plan of salvation would be fulfilled. But let's just, let's just focus on this one aspect that Herod was a king who killed to stay in power but Jesus is the king who died to give us life. What a difference. Jesus 
said in John 14 and verse number 6, I, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And he said in John 15 verse 13, Greater love hath no man than this, than that a man lay down his life for his friends. Whereas most earthly rulers will do whatever it takes to stay in power. And many of them even have resorted to murder in order to eliminate those who might be a threat to their power. Jesus was the exact opposite. Jesus came to this earth and He did everything that He could to save us. He suffered mockery and abuse so that we could be saved. He gave His life so that we could have eternal life. Herod murdered the innocent sons and daughters of the inhabitants of Bethlehem and the cities around it in a vain attempt to remain on the throne. But God gave His innocent Son to die for the guilty sons and daughters of this world, so that we might live. So I want to ask you a simple question. Who do you want on the throne of your heart? Do you want King Herod? Or do you want King Jesus? I know when I phrase it like that, we say, well, I would never put Herod in control of my life if I had anything to say about it. But do you understand this morning that if Jesus is not on the throne of your heart, then some Herod is? Because even if it's you, you have the same sin in you that Herod had. He just took it to its logical conclusion. You may not be there yet, but the same sin is residing in your heart. And if you say, well, I'm going to be the one in charge of my, uh, my life, and I'm going to do what I want, and I'm going to go where I please, and I'm going to say what I want, nobody can tell me what to do, I'm going to live my life how I want to live my life, you're just putting a little Herod on the throne of your heart. Why would you want to put a selfish, arrogant, uncaring murderer in control of your life? Don't put Herod on the throne. Make Jesus your king. That starts, first of all, at the moment of salvation. When you accept the truth of the gospel, that Jesus, the King of kings and Lord of lords, came to this earth to die for your sins, He was buried and He rose again and offers eternal life. And you place your faith in Jesus to save you. That's where it begins. And once you know Jesus as your Savior, then you must surrender your will to His. You have to make a conscious decision. I'm going to let God be in control of my life. Paul begged the believers to do this in Romans chapter 12. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your lives a, a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Put Jesus on the throne and keep Him there. With heads bowed and eyes closed this morning. This might be a little bit different of a Christmas message than one you are used to hearing. But I believe that it's one of the most important truths that we have to wrestle with. Who is going to be in control of your life? So often we behave like Herod, selfishly and arrogantly scheming and manipulating to stay in control ourselves instead of simply surrendering. Even like our Savior, who is the King of kings, yet He still surrendered to the Father's will. Who's going to be in control of your life? 
Will it be King Jesus? Or will it be some little Herod? 